Welcome. We bid you welcome, John Clauser, Johnny Metal, the Metal Dad, coming to you from my music corner of the world. And my faithful co captain, my fellow gunfighter, my fellow, uh, um, let's see, bad guy. I have to think of some of the song, light, song titles that we're getting into here. Um, slowly becoming one of my best of friends here. John, the music nut, right how you doing, my you, friend? Brother. Right back at you, man. <laughs> Amen, brother. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I like it on top, too. And I like it on top. <laughs> oh, gosh. And line them up and I'll knock them down. That's right. <laughs> oh, boy. How you doing, John? <laughs> oh, man. I'm going to bring out the angel in me. I can see it now. There you oh, go. Oh, boy. Yes. <laughs> Folks, episode two, Dangerous Toys, December. This time we're going to look at their second album, Delacious mm -hmm. Acres, released on June 4th, 1991. Billboard charts topped up at 67. We have a little bit of a producer change on this one. We go from Max Norman to Roy Thomas Baker. That's an interesting switch. Um, but there's a little bit more about that because I've I've learned some interesting things being on the social network of dangerous toys in their in their Facebook group. So uh with that said, John Music Nut, I'm just gonna give it to you right now and let's 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 uh let's have a little fun with this. All right. Thank you, John. If you saw the comments in the Dangerous Toys album review that John and I did, I updated my ranking from the first album from eight to an eight point five. There's a reason for it. It's because I quite like this album a lot, too. Mm -hmm. But it just doesn't have the knockout hit singles like the first album did. That's what I'll say. We got Roy Thomas Baker in. You've heard Roy Thomas Baker. What did he do? Well, he did most of the 70s albums with Queen, including Sheer Heart Attack, Night the Opera, and Jazz. He also did the first four Cars albums. He mm -hmm. did... Infinity and Evolution for Journey, two excellent albums by Journey. He did Cheap Trick One on One, Foreigner, Head Games, Devo. Oh no, it's Devo. Oh wow. Ozzy, No Rest for the Wicked, Motley Crue, Too Fast for Love, Darkness, One Way, Ticket to Hell and Back, and for Rand Kelly, yes, Heaven and Earth. All right. We got the same I don't think I don't think most Yes fans will be have be okay with that, but <laughs> I don't even know if this is considered one of their better ones either. I I, I think I, it's at the bottom of the pile. Yeah, pretty much. Well, well, well Rand will tell you. Well, well, then again, he loves nearly everything. Yes, so you know maybe he'll say I actually think this is a pretty great album. Well, you know what? This is a very good album too. All right, so we got the same lineup as before. The only thing is now you got Danny Aaron playing on to get playing on the album instead of not just being on the cover and being mm -hmm. on the videos. So you got Jason McMaster, lead vocals, Scott Dalhover, Dalhover guitar, Danny Aaron on guitar, slide guitar, backing vocals. There you go. We got Mike Watson on bass backing vocals and Mark Geary on drums. Now, in my opinion, I listened to this album. I think this deserved a better fate. I think this would have did better business if it came out the year before. Because it's quite good, but now you start to compete with grunge. Grunge is about to take over the world. And you're considered of a genre that's passe. Although mm -hmm. if you listen to this band, there was more grit to this band. They were not really a, a hair metal band. This was just a good heavy rock and roll band. Um, but they they were marketing nearly everything as hair metal. Was enough's enough hair metal? No. Enough's enough was power pop. But they put them in all this makeup and all this garbage. Was L.A. Guns hair metal? No, they really weren't. You listen to that early stuff, and as my good friend Jack would say, rest in peace, Jack, he um he compared them to the New York Dolls. Yeah, and when I, I can see that. First couple albums, they sounded a lot like the New York Dolls. Dangerous Toys had a great sound. Yes, there are influences, but the influences are a lot less on this album. Let's get to the songs. Gunfighter has this slow burn with some sly guitar and harmonica. So right there, they differentiate themselves from the pack. This is a band from Texas, isn't it? 
that Texas sound is a little more apparent on here, I think, overall, Big than time. was on the debut. And this is a, this comes roaring out of the gate. It's a hard-hitting track. It's pretty good. I don't think it's as good as Tease and Pleasing, but I don't know if anything on here is quite as good as Tease and Pleasing or Scared, but I think this is a more consistent album overall. Mm-hmm. Gunfighter's a strong opener. Not top-notch, but strong. Give Me No Lip was the video and single. It's, it's got this heavy shuffle. Mm-hmm. The chorus reminds you a little teasing. There's a little bit on this that reminds you of teasing and pleasing. There's also a part on here, a breakdown after the solo's over. It reminds you of Robert Plant and Jimmy Page. Mm-hmm. All in response during the singing and the guitar play, and it's really cool. Do I think this should have been the first single? No. But it's very good. Sticks and Stung should have been the first single. That's yes. the next track. What a freaking chorus. This chorus is so catchy. I love this song. Catchy as sin. Should have been the single. Do you hear this a couple times? It's stuck in your head. I think they dropped the ball on this one, uh, Columbia Records. <laughs> then we get to Best of Friends. This is about, about losing a friend from your youth. It is a wonderful song, and I think timing really hurt this song. I hear this song, and I think of songs that were coming out in 1990. Something to Believe in by Poison. Bow to Jane by L.A. Guns. This would have fit right in with those songs. Mm -hmm. And it's a true story, and it's very autobiographical. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. This could have been a hit to me. I really believe it. I know that a lot of Dangerous Toys fans say this is their best song. You can't argue with that, especially if you've gone through this in your life. I've lost a lot of friends in my life, but not like this, Um, which is described in the lyrics. John, I'm sure you're going to go more in depth into this. Um, But uh, this is a wonderful song. Now, on top, reminds you of the first album. Here comes the sex and debauchery or debauchery again. Yep. Yep. Cool and they know our song. I mean, but again, cool riff reminds you a little ACDC. Mm-hmm. Catchy as sin. Very good. Mm-hmm. Very good. And you got sugar, leather, and the nail. I wanted to make sure I got that right. This feels a little like Motley Crue, same old situation. But a little better, not but, but um, you know, a little harder, you know. Again, catchy. Same old situation is a catchy song. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one is as well. I like the slide guitars in here. Um, very cool. Angel and You is close to seven minutes, but it gives this album diversity. Mm-hmm. This is like a blues rock. It doesn't feel seven minutes because you got this great guitar playing and. The guys are going back and forth. Yep, exactly. Scott's playing a line. Danny's playing a line. They're going back and forth. You can hear it in each speaker. And it's really tasteful. Very, very good. This is a cool tune. Uh, It's a mid-tempo blues rock. Very cool. Feel Like Making Love. This is the cover of the Bad Bad Company hit single that went top 10 back in... I must say 1975. Oh my god. Yeah, I think it was it, it was off the second album, Straight Shooter. <clears throat> this is okay. I if they were gonna do a cover, a bad company cover, I think they should have did something that was a little deeper, more of an AOR track. Like, can you imagine them doing something like Shooting Star or Silver Blue and Gold? I think that would have been a better choice. Instead of something that's one of the two or three most famous songs by Bad Company. Yeah. And, and Bad Company, had, you know, they they only had a few hits, but they had a lot of popular songs that got played heavy over the years, particularly on AOR. So it's yeah. good. I don't think it's great. Uh, now, Line Them Up. This was a single and video. Another cool tune. I love the staccato riffing mm-hmm. and singing with the staccato riffing mm-hmm. during the pre-chorus. This is really catchy. Um, really strong track here. Um, Gypsy, Black and Blue Valentine. Another great tone. Another great song. Another great catchy. 
um song here i mean near the end of the song the one thing about this album near the end of the album the song stays strong which i don't think they really did on the first album um here it stays strong throughout um this is a cool tune bad guys a cool closer the rhythm's carrying the track another thing on here again you really hear the separation between the instruments you hear a lot more of the rhythm section here you hear that bass if you're a bass player you hear the bass up a lot of times it's just the bass and drums carrying the song and it's very good they like i was saying they put out a video for give me no lip and they put out a video for line them up and give me no lip i don't know there's just something about that video for me i mean because it's um it's mostly performance but then you see the sky above them and then you see these badass street scenes and hot chick on payphone and fire and ice not just because it's my favorite restaurant i said because fire and ice that's in the video that's what you got cool Hmm. stuff now line them up is a cool video um because that one they go between it's mostly performance but they're going black (laughs) and white to color this is Mm -hmm. a cool tune uh, and a cool video as well now, how do I rank it? I'll give it an eight because it's better, stronger, more consistent overall. No knockout hit, not as heavy as the first album. The first album was a little heavy, um, but still quite good. You put it out in 1990, maybe this goes gold again. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. They don't have the knockout hit. They, maybe they don't have a tease and please and they're scared, as I've said a couple times already. But this deserved a better fate, Alicia Sakers. Eight out of ten. Thanks. Okay. Rock and roll. Yeah. That's good right. stuff. Good, good stuff. Um mm-hmm. so for me, uh when I when this one came out again, I was just I'm enamored by Bill. I just love I just love the the Bill character here. He just he just looks so just absolutely badass. I mean, let's That's face it. Right. He just he just I mean, you see this kind of clown coming your way, you I could see why people would are scared of clowns sometimes. Um anyway, uh Gunfighter for me, gosh, okay, maybe this isn't a tease and pleasing, but boy, this hit me where I needed to be. Man, this comes this comes out and just slaps you in the face cuz it's just it's like a thrashy boom, ba, bum, ba, bum, ba. You know, it's just really, it's just a pump and thrashy tune with a blues rock influence because you got that slow burn where you feel like you're out in the West somewhere, but there's like a circus off the background too. So you got that nice, you know, you get that nice Western feel, that nice Texas, hot Texas feel. And then they just come in hot, you know, with that heavy, that heavy rhythm. Uh, I love the guitar solo in that, uh, when that, when they start breaking it down, they, and the, you know, the, drum starts going faster and faster it's just ah, i just love that song always one of those songs you know the gunfighter gunfighter looking for love you know hey he's got a violent lifestyle but he's got a soft side he still wants to be loved uh give me no lip uh you know here's my notes for give me no lip oh woman just shut up (laughs) (laughs) i mean no what more what more can you say about about the song lyrically really i mean there's not much you can say about this song but it's man just a straight up hard bluesy rocker you gotta love that cut that call and response that you mentioned already you know jason just does such a good job with the with the uh, uh the emotion and the and the delivery of that whole thing just perfect um Let's see. Uh, sticks and stones. Of course, you you get the you get the old sticks and stones might break my bones, but but you know words will never hurt me or names will never hurt me or whatever it is. You know you, you get that play on that because hey, you know they 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 they're talking about you know we're we're just a rock band we we're we're playing rock music. It's you're not going to go to hell because we're listening to your our, your kids are listening to our music. You know just uh, you know rock and roll hasn't hurt me yet so. Great song, great riff. Uh, one thing, like you said, all of these choruses are just catchy as can be. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm just going to say that right out the gate. There's no reason for me to repeat myself 11 times. <laughs> you know, every song here just has that catchiness to it, whether it's the riff, whether it's the the the, the hook in the chorus. Uh, Jason just does. Jason just does a wonderful job of delivering all the line, all the lyrics here. So it's just 
certainly perfect all around mm-hmm. best of friends probably my all-time favorite dangerous toy song i just absolutely love this track um i will say this though um now mike watson writes wrote the lyrics for this one and i have seen where he has talked about this song on the dangerous toys um group he says it's not exactly autobiographical okay but there's enough because he did kind of embellish some things but who's who's to say that somebody who who doesn't know somebody that we we've had this kind of feeling with yeah. you know and back in 1991 when this when this came out you know i would think of my best probably my best friends like dave and mike especially mike um he they were the ones that you know cuz mike was the more of the the guy who would probably be it, you know cause the trouble you know and 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 get into get into problems with the law kind of thing and you know, maybe not, maybe not get in trouble with the law, but he, he certainly wanted to raise the roof a little bit, you know? So if anybody, if any of my friends would have been like that, Mike, and thank God he's not, you know, I love you, Mike, you know, but uh, you know, he, I don't, he would have been the closest one. And I just think, how would I, how would I react to something like that? You know, I, I think of a friend where he just passed away about a month ago. His name was Larry. And he and I watched a lot of wrestling shows together. We were good. Fr- we were very good friends until, you know, life kind of took us in different directions. I moved here to Alabama and I just didn't get to see him or, or talk to him all that much um, over the last 20 years. I'd see him. I saw him maybe once and that was it because I just just couldn't get up there to see him. So it was it was hard. Uh, but I, ca- I consider Larry a very good friend. Even like I said, we just drifted. We just drifted apart and we just didn't get to talk, you know, and I regret, I do regret that. But I think, I think the moral of the story, I think with what Mike was trying to say was, you know, if you've got these good friends like that, don't, don't, don't let them slip away. You know, if you're thinking about them, especially these days, it's easy to reach out and text somebody, maybe 1990, 91. Yeah. You couldn't, you can't exactly text anybody, you know, but, uh, but you, you can just at least let people know that you're thinking about them, you know? So but uh, just a just a wonderful uh, slower song. Uh, another song I kind of thought I that came to my mind when you were thinking like Ballad of Jane and and uh, something to believe in. I was thinking of when Ugly Kid Joe did Cats in the Cradle. Yes, you know that to me was another song that would fit in there more. You know, maybe more than words a little bit. Uh, yeah. You know, so you had you to had be these, with you. to be with you, of course. That you know that was another another mammoth acoustic hit from a. <laughs> from a heavy metal band, hard rock band that was no more for their talent, more so than anything else. But then you give them this three or four chord song and they make, they got a number one hit out of it. Uh, Nelson, you know, they're, that first Nelson album, After the Rain. Love and Affection, After the Love Rain. Love and Affection, After the Rain. And more than ever. Great more than, Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff there. I I saw Nelson, you mentioned of um, um, more uh, Enough's Enough. Enough's Enough was the opening band for that. So it was, uh, I have a picture somewhere of I actually got to meet the Chip and Donnie. But anyway, nice. off the off off on a tangent here. Um, on top, you you said it best. <laughs> let's let's get on with the debauchery. But a solid That's blues right. rocker, solid blues rocker about about a woman who likes to ride bareback. Um, Okay, that's just that was a bad joke, but but still solid blues rocker, just a great, just a great catchy chorus. Everything about it was just so catchy. Uh, sugar, leather, and the nail. Uh, <clears throat> what was one of the lines in this song? Hold on, hang hang on. I gotta I gotta look this one up here. Um, I make you sticky with a splash of my honey. Yeah, yeah. We don't need to go any further into that one. Uh, but here again, <laughs> you get that slide guitar with an ACDC like rock, riff rocker here. Just a just a great, just a great album uh, side closer. Side two opens up with Angel and You. This is probably this is probably another one of this would probably be in my top five uh right. of 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 uh of dangerous toy songs because I I always love this song. I love that's that little blues riff that they do for it. Um, and then you get this long guitar solo, you know, that back and forth, that back and forth, that back and forth. I loved that. Loved it. And then you end with that slide guitar 
crescendo where you know then then the drums start creeping up the tempo and and everything and then you get that slow down section again and you get jason kind of slithering in kind of sexy sound and, and you know that brings it back into the chorus great track yeah it doesn't feel like it definitely does not feel like seven minutes long but it's a what a wonderful mm-hmm. track um feels like feel like making love um they pretty pretty much just just played this one straightforward yeah <laughs> yeah nothing really nothing really new nothing really different they just kind of do it in their own style and you know he doesn't jason obviously doesn't try to sound like paul rogers in any way shape or form here but they pretty much just play it straight nothing wrong with it i think it's i think it's a good job i think they did a well a very good job with it uh line them up funky rocker here you know uh yeah. Okay. Lyrics here talk about maybe just wanting to make a name for themselves, no matter what it takes. But I love the funky grooves. I love the the gang vocals that's on this thing. There's a lot of gang vocals on this album. And yeah, maybe that's a maybe that's a little bit of a Roy Thomas Baker influence there with those extra layer of vocals. Uh, <clears throat> I thought that was a great. I thought that was a fun song. Uh, Gypsy, Black and Blue Valentine. You know, here again. Uh, how's how's the how's that line go? Uh, uh gyps uh let's see gypsy black and blue valentine had enough a hang time got you hanging around wasted wasted from the hips down gypsy yeah so we're talking about a, a, a probably a prize striptease dancer and obviously her life is just she's just she's just getting t- you know, wasted from the hips down well she's getting tired probably tired of the lifestyle maybe but but again such a catchy track catchy fun song just a good straight up rocker ends off with bad guy with a driving riff you get that you get that uh that wicked little bass groove that mike's got going on on it Mm -hmm. just a it's a fun closer it doesn't it doesn't feel like a it doesn't feel like an album closer quite the way like like uh that dog did Mm -hmm. that dog to me felt like a felt like an album closer i felt like on bad guy they could have still done another song you know, and, and then that would have made an appropriate album closer. So there you go. Um, this one for me, um, I give this, I, this one's probably a little bit lower for me. I gave it, I gave the first one a 10. I'd probably give this about an eight and a half to eight and three quarters, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, while I still have very fond memories of just about every one of these songs, um, you're right. I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's something about that first album that's just so infectious and it yeah. just it just sticks to you like glue but there's but there's but the highs on this thing are very high so that's what i really like about it um the dangerous toys nation has a lot to talk about with this one um and one thing that i was and I, I, i'm gonna go into a little bit of it before we go into the tour dates i figure i'm gonna just kind of roll with this one a little bit um one of the things that was talked about was um Todd Enderby here mentions uh, he felt that in the production, when I bought the original tape release, it just sounded so squelchy and pitchy could never quite get it. The debut is my favorite. Jason actually answers this guy. He's one of the, he's one of the admins on the, in the group. And he felt the same way. He felt um, the, the, the mix and the mastering weren't, because they they were not involved in the process. Okay. And so when they first heard it, they were like, "Oh boy. Um not exactly what we would have gone for." But at that point, it would have been as Jason puts it, super expensive to go back and fix. And it would have pushed back a release date, which as you mentioned, if they'd waited any longer, this album might not have peaked at number 67. It probably wouldn't have it probably would have peaked a lot lower. Um, but the thing, the thing that really surprised me, and again, I'm not going to go into everybody's stuff here because a lot of people, while they like this, they love this album. They, they, some of it liked the first one better. They liked pissed better. Um, a lot of people like it. A lot of people are looking for a vinyl reissue as one person say, Hey, can we get a remix master of this album? So I thought that was a nice, nice play on words here. Um, there you go. But yeah, uh, there was a few folks that were talking about the uh, the production just not being like the one guy said, very squelchy, very pitchy. 
Uh, mm-hmm. Some people love Jason's vocals on this, like we've already talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, Michael Parks here. Fantastic album. My favorite by DT. Artwork is captivating. Gunfire ranks right up there as one of my one of the last great rock and roll songs written. Wow. High praise. That's, that's extremely high praise. So Tommy Pons, the artist of the of the albums, he chimes in. The original idea for the cover was far darker and moodier than the final release. It was a dilapidated amusement park with the clowns surrounded by creatures, demons, and a light in a light rain. The colors were monochromatic, purples, grays, and greens, etc. But the art department at Sony made me do that do that loud piece instead. So, mm-hmm. so this is what we get. So he he apparently didn't didn't think that this was appropriate. He didn't like that one. So, <clears throat> but uh, so between Tommy Pons and Jason, um, I'll, I'll finish kind of what J- what Jason says here. It's not our favorite mix and mastering job. We weren't there for the process. It was a concern of ours and would have gone way over budget and held up our release date to change anything. It was an honor to work with Roy Thomas Baker. I would imagine so. Um, And the recording was great. Tones were great. Then we heard the final mixes and it was seemingly oversaturated with compression and reverb. Uh, This is coming from Jason himself now. So I don't know if you have anything you want to think about that with with how you listen to this album, if you, if you picked up on anything like that. Um, the pit, pitchy with his vocals a little bit. With, I, I, I hear that here, mm-hmm. but I, yeah, on some, on some of the songs that he sings, he sings well, but yeah, there is something with the pitch on there. Yeah. yeah I would, I would say that. And I was wondering, I, Nate, I, I wonder if it was in the music too, that they're referring this to too. Cause you know, some of those guitars are really kind of there's a lot of reverb going on in the guitars and mm-hmm. you know there's a yes, lot of different things is. going on but um he says we were not suggesting it to sound like a classic album like uh, like Roy's other productions uh we took that right. for granted it's not our favorite release but we agree that about half of the songs on this one are, we are proud of gunfighter sugar angel line them up give me no lip and best of friends so um obviously it was uh they they have a they have some very high regard for at least for at least half of the half the songs on this thing. Mm-hmm. Um so uh so there you go. Um that's really about all I'm gonna talk about because everybody it was kind of like last week. There's a lot of a lot of the fans have a lot of good things to talk about with this album, but it's just mostly the same kind of thing. They love it, or they they're like, Yeah, it's okay, but the debut is better, or they like pissed, or they like the artist better. So there you go. So Dangerous Toys Nations, there you have it. Thank you, Jason and Tommy, for participating in that little thread. I want to give you guys a shout out if you ever watch this thing. I appreciate you doing that. Um, John, I'm going to turn it back now to you. And let's hear some. Let's hear about the touring they may have done with this album. Okay, 36 dates, 34 in the U.S., 2 in Canada. Hmm. Before we get to the dates, the songs played from this album, the first nine. Gunfighter, Gimme No Lip, Sticks and Stones, Best of Friends, On Top, Sugar Leather and the Nail, Angel and You, Feel Like Making Love, and Line Them Up. Okay. Okay. They started a back room in Austin. I believe they started their tour for the first album there. They played Palmer Auditorium in Austin. They played with Archangels and Texas Tornadoes. I don't know about Texas Tornadoes, but I love that Archangels album. Yeah, I've heard good things about that. We did a <laughs> review of that album. I believe it was Byron Bolt, Grant Arthur, and I. We talk about it on Grant's Rock Warehouse. So if you'd like to check out Grant's channel on YouTube, you can check out our review of the Archangels album, which is a very good album. On the Rocks in Dallas, Texas, Summerfest in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Now from here. It's the Operation Rock and Roll Tour. Listen to this lineup. I'm going to try to, I'm going to say the headliner at the end. We got Motorhead. We got Metal Church. We got Dangerous Toys. We got Alice Cooper and Judas Priest ending the show. I remember that tour. I didn't get to see it, but boy, I remember it. I remember hearing about it. Wow. 
Wow, what a tour. And they played Salt Palace in Salt Lake City, Utah, Irvine Meadows Amphitheater in Irvine, California. I saw two dates for that venue on Setlist FM. Cal Expo Amphitheater, Sacramento, California. Red Rocks Amphitheater, Morrison, Colorado. I got to get there one day. God, I got so many friends over the years who said that acoustically there's nothing finer. I would love to see something at Red Rocks. I think I think one of the, my first introductions to Red Rocks was the U2 Under a Blood Red Sky album. Me too. <clears throat> and by the way, that, that is a fantastic live album. I yes, mean, it is. We did a U2 series. On Ryan's Vinyl Destination. That's when John and I really started to get to know each other. Yep, um, it was. So you know that. But we did the we reviewed the whole U2 catalog. And if you ever want to see some three-hour-long shows on two U2 albums, then that is the series for you. Yes, it is. <laughs> if you need a cure for... <laughs> no, nah, we, we were good. But, I mean, but they were long. I, I was about to say something. You probably could figure it out there, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> But they were there, was, there were there were also about five or six of us on these panels. So that's it was, true. There that's was a true. lot of people, and everybody had a lot of good things to say about it. And we just it just they it were just really long fun. shows, but they were it was so much fun going through that catalog. But it I digress. Really and I learned a lot because I used to I used to swear by the '80s albums, and then from doing that series, I learned they had some great later albums as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. No doubt about it. Um, so anyway, five season five season center Cedar Rapids, Iowa. World Music Theater, Tinley Park, Illinois, Lakeland Civic Center, Lakeland, Florida, Orlando Arena, Orlando, Florida, Coca-Cola, Lakewood Amphitheater, Atlanta, Georgia, hmm. The Summit in Houston, Texas, Oh, um, Hardy's Walnut Creek Amphitheater in Raleigh, North Carolina, Coca-Cola Star Lake Amphitheater, Burgettstown, Pennsylvania, Star Plaza Theater, Maryville, Tennessee, I'm sorry, Indiana, Richfield Coliseum, Richfield, Ohio, Brendan Byrne Arena, East Rutherford, New Jersey, The Spectrum in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Great Wood Center for Performing Arts, Mansfield, Massachusetts, Capitol Theater, Landover, New Jersey, the next night, Hulk Hogan versus Sergeant Slaughter in a flag match. Boy, can Sergeant Slaughter go for a big man? What you gonna do? What you gonna do, brother? You puke! You maggots! Sergeant Slaughter's the man. Hulk Hogan gave us... Hulk Hogan and Sergeant Slaughter gave us so many great times. Mm -hmm. Heel or face. Yep. Yep. Orange County Fairgrounds, Middletown, New York. Tour de Montreal, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. CNA Grandstand in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And the Livestock Festival in Zephyr Hills, Florida. There you go. Right. And uh, and it, sh it should be noted that at some point, uh, according to at least what I saw on Wiki, that apparently Danny Aaron left during either during the tour or right after the tour. So yeah. he, so yeah, so he does, he only plays on the one album. He does a couple of tours, but then he's gone. So uh, yeah. Um, so go figure that one out. Um, yeah. That would have been a, a mammoth tour. Cause let's see, Judas Priest would have been touring painkiller. Mm -hmm. uh, Metal church would have been. That what? would have been um, human factor. Probably human factor. Yeah. Um, Motorhead. I have no idea. 1960. <clears throat> Okay. Okay. Um and they were doing like seven songs. So I'm thinking their sets were like 20 minutes. Yeah. Must have been because, super... I mean they don't mess, they're like the Ramones. They don't mess around live. They just no. come in and they just kill you. Well, and they probably and, and, and a and a package tour like that, they probably know probably just did like their biggest songs, you know, probably like Ace of Spades and Bomber and uh Overkill or something like that. Well, to yeah. let you know, let you know, John, I did look at some of their dates, oh okay. And they were actually hitting 19. They would do like seven songs, but they do four off 1916. Oh, oh, oh. And then they do Ace of Spades, Killed by Death, and I'm not sure what they did off of Overkill. I don't know if they did the song Overkill or uh, Stay... Oh, God. It, it's come to me now, but it, it'll, yeah. it'll come to me. Or Stay Clean or Damage Case, one of them. And let's see, what Alice, Alice Cooper would have been touring... Um, hey Stupid. Hey Stupid. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, so that was, uh, you know, if you so you have you had painkiller, which was just the, you know, what watch this space. I'm just gonna, I'll just, I'll just give you that. Uh, you know, that was uh, that was mammoth. Um, metal church. Um, I I don't remember the Human Factor album that well. If I feel like I feel like after Blessing in Disguise, I kind of got off that train a little bit. So I did. I was the same way. I didn't get it. I didn't. I don't remember if I got that one or not. I love Blessing in, Dis- in Disguise. Don't get me wrong. That I too. love the album. I just I don't know. I just don't remember getting that. And I wasn't a big fan of Hey Stupid at the time because I just didn't. I didn't care for that. I didn't care for Poison. I didn't care for Hey Stupid. Um, I think I might like Hey they Stupid both. better than Trash. But uh, but anyway, um, yeah, that would have been a great tour. Yeah, I would have. Yeah, I would have. I. Probably could have driven to Philly if I had, if I could have been able to get tickets. Um, that would have been a that would have been a fun show to have seen because I because here's the here's the funny thing, never saw Judas Priest in concert. Still to this day, I've never seen Judas Priest in concert. Never saw Alice Cooper in concert. Oh wow! Okay. I never saw never saw Metal Church in concert. Never saw Motorhead in concert. I got close, but I never got to see Motorhead. And I never saw Dangerous Toys. So I I would have I would never have seen any of those bands in concert. Or I had I had never seen any of those bands in concert, and I still to this day have never seen him. But uh, I think that lineup of Metal Church, I think, is the one I would have liked to have seen the most because uh, I love my cow. Rest in peace, uh, God rest his soul. But uh, but he was he just took that he just took that took that band to a totally different direction with his voice. My God, what a what a voice he had. Um, yeah, and, uh, and like I said, Motorhead would kind of be a retirement project for me because I just. I know like the big songs and that's about as far as I go. So that was um, one of my biggest regrets. I was going to see them on their last tour and they were playing a venue. That I think it was up in Wonton, New York. It was a much bigger venue that, that they would normally play. The tickets were cheap. It mm-hmm. was them, Anthrax and Crowbot and Lemmy started missing shows. Mm. Now to me, I've always said, there's, the reason I believe there's a higher power is because Lemmy's still alive. And I would always, <laughs> well, there were five guys. I said it about David Crosby, mm-hmm. Mike Allman, Ozzy Osbourne, mm-hmm. Richards, and Lemmy. Yep. And my thought process at this time, and it was in 2015, is, oh, Lemmy will get better, and, and I'll see him then. And three months later, he died. So I didn't go to the show thinking right. he wasn't going to play. He did play that. They did play that night. They were only able to go about an hour because mm-hmm. let me like some of his shows, he was ending short because he just couldn't go on anymore. He wound up dying of cancer three months later. Yeah. Um, but uh, one of my bigger regrets for, I saw all those other bands and I was happy that I got to see metal church with Mike Howe, but it mm-hmm. was much later. It would right. have been the uh, 11 the album 11. Okay. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. generation nothing. I think it would have been eleven. And oh my God, what a bundle. Yeah. Yeah. Was. The the eleven was the that was the album he came back to him, I think. Correct. <clears throat> and yeah. Was, and that was and a good album. A, it was. He had a crew cut and he was thin. And like he had like the six pack abs going on. And mm-hmm. he was a bundle of energy. Yep. And he kicked our butts that night. They were great. It was like yeah. horrible. Mega Death headlined. But they, they came on second. Mm. And to me, they were the best band of the night. I yeah. know Lamont and Marth was on that and Suicidal Tendencies. I forget who the first band was. Uh, but yeah, Metal Church killed. And they ended with Beyond the Black, so I was going ballistic. Oh man. Beyond the Black. Yeah, I, I I always think of I, I always think of songs by Metal Church I'd love to hear. And I know this is like a totally different tangent than than right. Dangerous Story stuff, but but I think of like uh 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 some of the stuff from the gods of wrath for example you know i don't know how mike sound would have sounded singing that song you know but because because david david wayne was a much different singer than mike hal no doubt so uh <clears throat> but uh, you know gods of wrath is just an amazing track i always love that one um you know uh anything from blessing in disguise whether it's fake healer or anthem to the estranged or uh 
Badlands, you know, Badlands was, was a classic, absolute classic. They played Badlands and they opened with Fake Healer tonight. I saw him. Oh yeah. Yeah. That that re I I I'm not familiar with Todd Latori in, in the in his version of Queensryche, but I did hear that version that he does with Metal Church of of like an updated version of Fake Healer. And he contributed vocals to it. I was and I was okay. I was like, okay, this guy can sing. I just have never listened to that version of Queensryche, but uh yeah, good good stuff. Uh very, very, very good stuff. But um okay. Uh anything we need to be plugging for since since I've already given the dangerous toys nation their their due. Um <clears throat> uh, anything we need to be plugging as far as shows coming up where we can find you elsewhere. All right, so tomorrow at 11 a.m., I'll be doing a show with Joe Beck. Wasted some time with Average Joe. This album is great. This is about albums that we had and then we rediscovered and they were great. And I don't know. I mean, I got five. I, I, I'm not sure what I'll be talking about, but um, <laughs> you know, I, I think I'll come up with some good ones. Oh, yeah. Uh, there et cetera, you go. Et cetera. Sure. Yeah, so. So um that that will probably be out there by the time you watch this video. Mm -hmm. Oh, let me see. What do we got? Uh, Thursday, I think on Grants Rock Warehouse. I think we got Ernesto, DC, Byron, Grant, and I. We're going to be talking about the first Whitford St. Holmes album. And I better start doing my research. Anyway, I'll I've been, I've been, I, 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 I have seen that album in my local record store, Seasick Records. And it's still yep. waiting. It's still waiting there. Yeah, I, I don't know why I I, I haven't bought it because I was never. A, I'm not that big of an a, an Aerosmith fan, but I I really feel like maybe I'll maybe this Thursday I may just get it because I I am heading that way. So maybe I'll get you it. Get that cheap, get it because I'll tell you what it's it's. I think it's like I think they want it like I think they want like eight bucks for it. So it's, oh my god, it's a fortune on CD. Oh, that's why I didn't buy it. Um, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm gonna have to look. I'm gonna have to listen to YouTube and Spotify for this one just to let y'all know. Okay. Uh, let's see. Friday, um, John and I might be working together on this one. It's uh on Grab a Stack of Rock, which is uh Mike LeBrain's channel. Yep. We're gonna mm -hmm. talk about our five favorite Christmas songs. That's right. That's, That's gonna, gonna be, be fun. Live. That's gonna be live and in living color. Yep. That's right. I yep. I got a bunch of stuff in my brain I'm gonna talk about, but there's gonna be one certain artist who I've talked highly about that will certainly be mentioned that's right you don't hear his song anymore and it ticks me off you know what happened you know what the thing is it gets me pissed anyway yes Saturday. <laughs> because that's what's coming that's 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 what's coming next week people that's right we're gonna, we're gonna be we're gonna be talking this lovely little gem so um it does. and saturday well i don't know when this show's gonna air but a bunch of us are going to talk about Saxon's Crusader album. I got Ooh. a lot of stuff to talk about on that one. Nice. I actually, theories. I actually have that. Uh, I have that on vinyl. I haven't taken the time to listen to it though. But I, I did pick it up because I saw it in my stories not too long ago. So I do actually have that. But um, I think well, I got a cassette still sitting around here. I'll, if I find a cassette before the show, I'll definitely do that. So yeah. yeah. But yeah, I, I got, I got, I got, I got to go deeper in my in my Saxon catalog. I got, <clears throat> I got a lot of catching up to do with their stuff. But uh, oh, um, <clears throat> so, so okay, so, um, so other than the, other than the uh, the the grab a stack of rocks, so that's that's the only other show I've got lined up for the. Well, no, I take that back. Uh, I think we're going to be doing, and this this will probably happen by the time we you see this on Wednesday. Because, <clears throat> because again, the, there's two of you out there that like us doing these shows on Wednesday nights. So we're, we appreciate you. and we appreciate you, Ernesto, and and anybody else who watches. But uh, uh, no, but uh, uh, we're going to probably do a, a little bit of a Miles Goodwin tribute of some sort okay. um, on Tuesday night on Grants Rock Warehouse. We're going to get the band back together with Tim Durling and Mike Lube and Dave Lubin. Um, those guys were just. <laughs> You know, these guys are like they're they're the Dave and Tim are like the hardcore April Wine fans. And you know, Tim or Grant likes certain liked a certain area, but then he was like, Well, let's just keep going with the whole catalog. So he he was like he he got himself introduced to the rest of the catalog. I'm I got on because like, well, I know I know if you see K, but somehow I got I got rooked into doing the set the series and I became I became a fan of April Wine. So I really like this, I really like the band. So uh I'm looking forward to figuring out what I'm going to do with that. Um, 
but and I didn't I I'm gonna be I'm gonna be sneaky because I didn't I didn't say I didn't say anything to John about this one. But on Amazon, y'all, you can buy this little thing. Down for the count. Uh Tim Durling. Uh this is an album review book, very similar to one that uh, John worked on with um, the uh, Martin Popoff uh, on Blue Oyster Cult. And uh, yeah, John's on, John's in this book. And he covers, uh, he, he, you cover the last three albums, uh, studio albums, mostly. That's where, that's where your, that's where your territory was. So, uh, uh, so yeah, I, I literally, the thing came out about it. You can get it on Amazon and it literally just came out like a couple of days ago. So, yeah. and, and I just, I just got, I just got, I, I ordered it and got a copy. And I think I got it Friday night. So, uh, right. um, so I haven't really had a chance to really read through this uh, yet. Uh, but, uh, but yeah. So uh, John, John's fate featured on this one. So, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you're a YNT fan, go to Amazon, look, look for Tim Durling and look it up. Um, I believe it's a print on demand kind of style thing like they did right. with like what he did with his unspooled book, right. uh, the, uh, the book on a tracks and basically the art of collecting and <laughs> music collecting. Right. But uh, so there you go. I, I had to put I had to sneak that plug in there. Thanks so much, uh, no problem, brother. No problem. Hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, maybe uh, I can get you and Tim that we should do a, uh, a show about how what got how that got started. But uh Sure. Uh, of doing the uh, doing the doing the album re- or the the book review thing the the discography discography review, but yeah, next week, yeah, we're gonna we're just gonna get we're just gonna get pissed. <laughs> yeah, you know, hopefully not pissed drunk, but we're gonna get pissed. But uh, yeah, we're gonna take a little different look at what uh, at what Dangerous Toys is doing. So there you go. So for my faithful co captain John John the Music Nut. John Klaus, Johnny Metal, the Metal Dad, coming to you from a music corner. Like, share, subscribe. Let us know what you thought of Hellacious Acres. Tune in next week when we get pissed. See ya. Cheers.